is August 30th. It's InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Paul Joseph Watson on tonight's show. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, Aaron Dykes interviews why in the world are they sprains Michael Murphy about how airplanes are filling our skies with more than just travelers. Then, NATO's plot to use ambulances as a cover for humanitarian intervention in Syria is revealed. Plus, caught on tape, not one but two videos of shocking police brutality exposed. All this and more, coming up on the InfoWars Nightly News. First story up tonight, Texas students revolt against mandatory RFID tracking chips. Students and parents at two San Antonio schools are in revolt over a program that forces kids to wear RFID tracking name tags, which are used to pinpoint their location on campus as well as outside school premises. Students at John Jay High School and Anson Jones Middle School will be mandated to wear tags from today, which will be used to track them on campus as well as when they enter and leave school. Andrea Hernandez is leading a group of students who refuse to wear the tags because in her words, it, it quote, it makes me uncomfortable, it's an invasion of my privacy. And so again, this is prisoner training. That's what it amounts to. You've got children being prepared for their introduction into the outside world. They're being indoctrinated to accept that their every movement is being tracked as if it's completely normal, rational thing to be happening. But it's all for the kids' safety, of course, as the school claims. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that they've got a $2 million check from the government waiting for them if they improve attendance and get rid of truancy. And speaking of prisoner training, I mean, in some ways, schools are becoming more pernicious than jails themselves because, you know, just like in jail, there are surveillance cameras everywhere, there are cops walking around everywhere as there are now in high schools. But you know, at least in jail, you're not being constantly indoctrinated. And on top of that, of course, with schools, we've got the deliberate dumbing down agenda, American kids getting more and more stupid because the system exists to strangle their individuality and stifle their natural talent. And that's what the education systems turn into. So it makes sense you know, when you're a breeding ground for slaves, that you're going to get them used to slavery by having them tracked everywhere. And they're, you know, they're rewarded for regurgitating what they're told to regurgitate. So it's all about this system of turning them into zombies, fresh and ready for the outside zombie slave world so they can fit into their little, you know, they can become their little brick in the wall in the outside world, as it were. So it's obedience training, that's what it is. It's, it's being rewarded for intellectually castrating yourself. That's what the modern, modern education system is all about. And now on top of that, it's being backed up by this prisoner training. We also had the article on Monday, of course, about kids in nine Austin schools being forced to carry around a GPS tracker while having to check in with a mentor uh, numerous times a day. And of course, that's not far removed again from a uh, criminal with a GPS ankle bracelet, you know, having to see a parole officer every day. It's not that far removed at all from just being a criminal in prison. That's the modern school system. And so, again, what's the solution? Well, it's to homeschool your kids and you can do it yourself. You don't need to pay out oodles of money for somebody else to do it. And there's organizations across America that will help you do that. So it's a problem with a solution, uh, but it's great to see that these kids in San Antonio are fighting back from just becoming another brick in the wall by rebelling against this program, which seeks to track them everywhere they go, both on school premises and at home. And, you know, just imagine how open to abuse that is. Remember the case from 2010 in Pennsylvania, where they had the software on the kids' school-issued laptops tracking them, watching them while they were at home. A, a kid actually got disciplined for indecent behavior in his own home because the school officials were watching his webcam. They were watching him through his webcam on his laptop. So there's all kind of sexual predators and people like that out there who are just waiting to take advantage of these surveillance systems being implemented by the schools. But in San Antonio, the kids are rebelling and fighting back against Big Brother. 
Next story, just in case, state of Alaska to stockpile mass amounts of food and supplies in giant warehouses. This is Mac Slava of shtfplan.com. With its remote location and dependence on the uninterrupted flow of supplies from the lower 48 states, the governor of Alaska has made disaster readiness a hallmark of his administration. Governor Sean Parnell worries a major earthquake or volcanic eruption could leave the state 720,000 residents stranded and cut off from food and supply lines. His answer? Build giant warehouses full of emergency food and supplies just in case. For some in the lower 48, it may seem like an extreme step, but Parnell says this is just Alaska. The state plans two food stockpiles in or near Fairbanks and Anchorage, two cities that also have military bases. Construction on the two storage facilities will begin this fall, and the first food deliveries are targeted for December. The goal is to have enough food to feed 40,000 people for up to a week, including three days of ready-to-eat meals and four days of bulk food that can be prepared and cooked for large groups. To put that number into perspective, Alaska's largest city, Anchorage, has about 295,000 people, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, and Juneau, its third largest, about 31,000 people. So, you know, while these food stockpiles are nowhere near enough to cover the population for any significant amount of time, you know, at least it's a start. And so when idiots laugh at you for buying storable food and being a paranoid kook for doing so, just point to the fact that the government's doing it, the government's getting prepared for earthquakes, for natural disasters, for all eventualities. So if they're preparing for it, why on earth shouldn't the citizenry be preparing for it at the same time? I mean, you get so much heat from some people about buying storable food and it being useless waste of money when the government's doing it. I mean, everybody's doing it. And if nothing happens, then you just eat it and save money anyway. So, you know, nobody loses out. Global news now. NATO plot to use ambulances as cover for humanitarian invasion of Syria. A source claims that NATO powers in coordination with Saudi Arabia are putting the finishing touches to a false flag plot to blame President Bashar al-Assad's forces for launching a chemical weapons attack as a precursor to a NATO intervention which will see ambulances as humanitarian cover for a military assault. The source told Syrian news channel Adunia that a Saudi company had fitted 1,400 ambulance vehicles with anti-gas and anti-chemical filtering systems at a cost of $97,000 each in preparation for a chemical weapons attack carried out by FSA rebels using mortar rounds. The further 400 vehicles have been prepared as troop carriers. The attack, which will involve the use of white phosphorus, sarin, and mustard gas, will be launched in a heavily populated town near the Syria-Jordan border, possibly Dara, after which the vehicles will pour in under the cover of humanitarian aid. The ambulances emblazoned with the slogan, Syrian People's Relief, they're friendly, they're humanitarian, nothing to worry about, will operate under the guise of an aid mission to help victims of the chemical weapons attack, but in re reality are nothing short of armored personnel carriers. So according to this source, this has been timed to uh, coincide with the statements we heard over the last week or two from both French President uh, Francois Hollande and, of course, Barack Obama, who both basically came out and said, look, if Syria not just uses, but if Syria merely moves its chemical weapons from one location to another, it's going to trigger an invasion. Forget the UN Security Council is going to trigger a military intervention outside of that framework. So the Al-Qaeda-led rebels have been given the gas masks. They've been given the stockpile of chemical weapons seized from Libya, of course, formerly under the control of Gaddafi. And the false flag chemical weapons attack, which many people in the blogosphere have been speculating about for weeks, is very much being prepared according to this source. And of course, it, the international NATO-aligned media will instantly blame it on Assad, just like the Hula massacre was instantly blamed on the Syrian government, despite the fact that, as the German newspaper FAZ documented, it was, in fact, carried out by the loving humanitarian democratic protesters, the NATO-backed rebels. And so, 
from this source, it looks like they're getting ready to launch this chemical weapons attack. Blame it on Assad. And then under the guise of humanitarian aid, bring these 1,800 ambulances in, which in reality are basically armoured personnel carriers chock full of fighters and weapons. And then that will be the initial buffer zone from which the secondary military intervention is launched on the justification that Assad attacked his own people with chemical weapons. We've seen that one before. And again, just to address this issue of state media, because this, com this source comes from Syrian state media, they reported on it. And we'll go on to illustrate this with our next story as well. I see the occasional feedback uh, on the comments, on the Facebook comments and whatever. Basically the tone of, you know, why is Infowars using st Syrian state media as a news source? And isn't it interesting that when you do use something like Syrian news channels or Russia Today, Press TV, whatever it is, you've somehow committed a journalistic war crime, but using something like the New York Times, the very publication whose lies about, you know, weapons of mass destruction, yellow cake, greased the skids for a war which led to the deaths of over a million people, that's the height of credibility. That's perfectly okay to use the New York Times as a source whose lies upon lies upon lies have led to wars and death on a mass scale, but don't dare use a Syrian news channel. That's bad. That's really bad. That's evil. And it's interesting, again, that using foreign media is seen as some kind of dirty, underhanded thing, and yet taking your information from CNN or MSNBC, these new news organizations that literally have to get permission, have to beg the White House to use Obama, Obama's quotes that he's already given them. We saw that story a few weeks ago. That's perfectly acceptable. That's okay to use them as a news source. So we'll continue to, to use you know, news sources from a vast array of media and make no apologies for it. And it's up to you, the reader, to decide whether it's credible or not, whether it comes from state media or not, and whether that matters. Because as we see with the next story, Operation Mockingbird 2012, New York Times writes a leak story critical of Obama to CIA. This is Steve Watson, Infowars.com. Emails obtained by advocacy group Judicial Watch have exposed the fact that a senior New York Times employee who covers national security for the newspaper provided the CIA with advanced copies of an article another writer was preparing that was somewhat critical of the White House over the upcoming Hollywood film about the killing of Osama bin Laden. The reporter, Mark Mazzetti, forwarded an advanced copy of a Maureen Dowd column to a CIA spokesperson a full two days before it was set to be published. The article, published August 7, 2011, discussed the upcoming Catherine Bigelow, Mark Bowell film, Zero Dark Thirty, and criticized the Obama administration for having, quote, outsourced the job of manning up the president's image to Hollywood. Mazzetti's emails show that he sent the piece to the CIA's Marie Hoff on August 5th, 2011, writing, quote, This didn't come from me, and please delete after you read. See, nothing to worry about. So basically, the New York Times sends an article critical of the Obama administration and Obama himself related to the uh, propaganda surrounding the death of bin Laden, the supposed death of bin Laden. The New York Times sends it directly to the CIA before it's even published in the newspaper. And when this came out a couple of days ago now, the, the New York Times are asked why it happened, why they did it. And they responded, quote, I can't go into detail, but I'm confident, this is one of the New York Times editors, I'm confident after talking to Mark that it's much ado about nothing. Continuing from the article, readers will have a hard time believing this explanation there was clearly a dialogue between Mazzetti and the CIA concerning the article. His request for correspondence to be deleted after reading clearly indicates that he knew full well who he was sending the article to and, what he, and that he could be landed in trouble if anyone discovered what he was doing. It is blatantly clear that the CIA was leaning on Mazzetti, pressing him for information on what the Times was going to report and that Mazzetti provided it. The fact that the CIA read Dowd's column before her own editors did has severe consequences as far as freedom of the press goes and should set alarm bells ringing. So the New York Times is pulling the old, you know, move along nothing to see here argument. 
except for the fact that there's a, there's a hell of a lot to see here. Because as this article documents, this is just the latest expression of the New York Times cozy relationship with the Central Intelligence Agency that started long before the weapons of mass destruction scandal, of course, way back in the 50s with Operation Mockingbird. From the article, the Times was the vital cog in the CIA's Operation Mockingbird, a secret campaign conceived in the 1950s to influence media output. Many believe, with some justification, as we have seen, that Mockingbird continues to this day. In a groundbreaking expose entitled The CIA and the Media, penned in 1977 for Rolling Stone, Carl Bernstein wrote, The New York Times, the agency's relationship with the Times was by far its most valuable amongst newspapers, according to CIA officials. It was general Times policy to provide assistance to the CIA whenever possible. And so that's been in place since the 50s. Bringing it up to date, of course, it was the New York Times earlier this week that changed the language of its article very subtly, but, but also very intentionally, to cover up for the fact that it initially reported the CIA was responsible for providing weapons directly to Syrian rebels. They actually admitted it in a New York Times article. As soon as the editor got hold of it, 15 minutes later, the passage was changed to say that the weapons were being provided by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the Gulf states. So we got the New York Times covering up for the CIA in that instance just this week. And on the wider topic of controlled state media, it was the New York Times, along with other news outlets, who actually agreed to the conditions laid down by the White House that they could only use certain quotes made by Obama if the White House gave them permission. So it goes back to what I was saying before. People laugh at state-controlled media as being not credible, you know, whether it be in Iran with Press TV, Russia Today, or Syria with Adunia, as we saw in the previous story. But how are they any worse than the New York Times? In fact, the New York Times is about 100 times worse. Knowingly manufacturing lies about yellow cake from Niger to grease the skids for war in Iraq, over a million dead because of that lie helping the war. You know, sitting on the warrantless wiretapping story for a year on orders of the uh, Bush White House back in 2004, and now covering up for the fact that the CIA is directly arming Syrian rebels. So a New York Times reporter sending advance copies of articles directly to the CIA for approval, for vetting, merely for a heads up, who knows? But what we do know is that the New York Times is in bed with the White House, it's in bed with the CIA, and that's the ultimate confirmation of the fact that just like Russia, just like Iran, just like Syria, uh, we have state-controlled media in the United States. Video shows cop kicking defenseless man in the throat. A new police brutality video shows a St. Paul officer kicking a defenseless man in the throat. Let's go to the clip. I mean... You see that? You see that? Did you see that? He kicked him in his chest. Kicked him in his chest. Oh my God! That's how we operate. Oh my God! He just says to put his hands behind his back. That don't mean he got a kick. Oh my God! On the ground. Kick him in his chest. Hey, you lying, man? I ain't even been around here. You lying? Oh my God! He better tase you, man. Oh my God! Boy, I got it all, G. I got the whole. You gotta be taking this. So it's 30-year-old Eric Hightower is the man you see being kicked in the throat, and the cop responsible for the assault is Jesse Zilge, and Zilge has been placed on administrative leave uh, by the police department while the incident's been investigated. So basically, Hightower was arrested for terroristic threats, they said, damaging property, but crucially, he's not being charged, so it appears as if he, he was innocent, as he proclaimed in the video. So the epidemic of police brutality sweeping America continues. But what's interesting to me is the fact that whereas these kind of incidents, you know, 10, 20 years ago were more reserved or being meted out against black people, 
now everyone's a target, as we're going to see with the next story. But what's got us to this stage, I think, is this kind of this kind of racist attitude that if this kind of brutality is only being visited on people of you know black people, then who cares? It's just a black guy in a poor neighborhood getting beat up by cops. And that's still the attitude amongst a lot of people. In fact, there was, there was a bizarre comment on the InfoWars story today which said something like, oh, look, he's obese. He's potentially violent. He's a Negro. Those are the exact quotes. Like the fact that he's overweight, pissed off because he's been kicked in the face and black. Those three reasons mean it's perfectly okay to kick him in the face. It's fine. You know, the guy's laying prostate on the ground, but apparently if he's fat, a bit angry and black, then that makes everything fine. You just kick him in the face all you want. And so while black people have been targeted for decades, you know, the crime of walking while black or the crime of driving while black, middle class America has kind of looked the other way, thinking that the same treatment's never going to be visited upon them. And it's like the same cop out when people said, oh, I don't care about the TSA groping people or radiation body scanners at the airports. I'm just not going to fly. Now the TSA's at political events, they're at prom nights, they're on the highways. And the attitude is, oh, I'm just not going to leave my house. So when you have the attitude of just not caring about tyranny or brutality because it's inflicted upon a, a race or an econ economic class of people that you don't identify with, then that tyranny only gets stronger. And soon it's, it's going to be knocking at your door. You know, it's like the famous uh, Martin Niemöller poem. First they came for the communist. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. And eventually, they're going to come for you. So if you don't care about black guys being booted in the throat, then uh, how about this next one? Shock surveillance video shows LAPD officers body slamming defenseless woman, again defenseless like the guy before, into the pavement during violent arrest. This is out of the blaze. A startling video that is making the rounds shows two Los Angeles police department officers snatching a female driver and violently slamming her body into the ground. Twice. The woman's alleged offence? Talking on her cell phone while driving and subsequently resisting arrest. As a result of the trauma, Michelle Jordan, 34, sustained intensive bruising and other related blemishes and injuries. So let's see the clip. Husband told NBC4 his wife was swearing at the officers, but both he and Branch say what happened next was excessive use of force. And, her, and knocked her down to the ground. Uh, shoved her arms up behind her back and handcuffed her. When the swearing continued, she was thrown to the ground a second time while handcuffed. Jordan's attorney, Sai Nazif, says these photos show the scratches and bruises she suffered. The LAPD says an internal affairs investigation is underway, and Police Chief Charlie Beck has seen the videotape. So this is a mother and an, a mother and a nurse who was pulled over for the egregious crime of talking on her cell phone while driving. And suffice to say, as you saw in the video, the incident didn't turn out too well for her. And you can see all the, the bruises that she received in the article, um, which is on the blaze. So they slam her to the ground twice. You know, these tough guy cops who apparently like to hurt women with the sin of talking on a cell phone. Um, and basically, again, just to treat her like complete crap, treat her like an animal, uh, just because they can, just because they've got a badge and a uniform. Quote, if a civilian were to assault a woman in this manner, he would go to jail, said the woman's lawyer. These officers must be held to the same standard. They have to be accountable. So as I said before, it's an epidemic, and it's being meted out against men, women, black, white, you name it. It's everybody. It's no longer restricted to uh, poor people and black people in poor neighborhoods. It's spreading like a cancer, like a disease. And so... I mean, we saw the, the story just a couple of weeks ago, the 21-year-old guy, you know, double locked in handcuffs, backseat of a police car, having already been searched by the police, and they claim he shot himself in the head while he was double locked, hand, handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. Again, an obvious murder cover-up, but because it's a young black guy who's accused of smoking marijuana, nobody seems to care. But when it gets visited upon everybody else, only then people seem to care about it. So, you know, while police are trained that the public enemy is, that the public is their enemy and that 
um, that are there to be fed upon for revenue generation and pain compliance, the epidemic is only going to escalate. But you know, now that everybody's armed with a cell phone camera, uh, these cops are starting to realize that they can't treat people like animals without making themselves famous on YouTube, which is now happening basically on a day-to-day -to -day basis. So these two stories are just from today. I mean, we could do stories, articles about police brutality every day. That's all we could write about if we really want, wanted to, because they're constant. The stories are constantly coming out every day. But that's just two from today uh, that, are up, that are up there on Infowars.com. And again, police treating American citizens like animals, like they've got no rights whatsoever. You combine that with the case of Brandon Rowe being abducted from his home, no charges whatsoever, no reason for his arrest. Um, and we're entering a very dangerous situation where the police state is right in our faces. Quote of the day now, this is a Spanish proverb. Law is like a spider's web. Catch the fly and let the hawk go free. Which is precisely what we've seen, of course, with the recent economic collapse. Uh, and it's endemic in society and, uh, you know, in general, as we've seen with the recent cases of police brutality. Coming up after the break on InfoWars Nightly News, we're going to have a Planet InfoWars update from Christy Hightower. Exciting new news about the social media network that thousands of people are joining. And also Aaron Dykes' interview with Michael Murphy coming up after the break. Stay tuned. Welcome, Planet InfoWars Patriots. I'm Christy Hightower, reporting for PlanetInfoWars.com. Just a little update on what's going on on the site. Um, I just want to bring to your attention, Alex always says, you know, Planet InfoWars is for people like you to go and find fellow pa patriots who are passionate, who, uh, you know, want to go camping, others that, you know, dating and, and all kinds of good stuff like that. Well, um, he's also said that articles are looked at and if they're well written, well cited, timely, all of the above, that we will put them on the featured stories on Infowars.com. Well, this week has been no exception. In fact, there's an article called The Conspiracy of an Empire, A Letter to Those That Serve the System by Infowars, Planet Infowars user Sean Helton. Um, and within hours of us finding it, we put it on Infowars.com, main featured stories, so I just want to remind you that we are looking, we are paying attention, so keep those awesome articles coming. Uh, thank you, Sean, and your partner, Nemo, for uh, writing that for us. Um, also, Alex is also saying, you know, PlanetInfoWars.com is a good place for dating. Now, the internet can be a little tricky, you know, to find somebody you want to, you want to talk to and, and be friends with and stuff. Um, but, lucky for you guys, um, Herbic07 and Lady Liberty uh, well, I guess not lucky for everyone, but lucky for these two. They found each other on PlanetInfoWars.com uh, a couple weeks ago, and they just want to let us know that, uh, that they're doing well. So I wanted to ask you two, um, Herbic07 and Lady Liberty, if it all works out, which one of you is going to be moving? Because uh, one of you lives in Texas and the other one in Virginia, so <laughs> I can't imagine the commuting is all that easy. Um, well, congratulations. And then lastly, we have, uh, we have a mission every week on the infographic group. Um, this week, we've actually been doing uh, fluoride, and the previous weeks have been things like guns, where we have um, InfoWars users send in pictures that they've designed, you know, on their Photoshop or Illustrator, or they've hand-drawn, and these are actually going to be used in all kinds of different places, um, on our Facebook, Alexander Emmerich Jones, or our Twitter, uh, Real Alex Jones. Uh, we've even started a Pinterest, Real Alex Jones. Uh, where you can go and find these cool images. So those are, those are awesome. Keep those coming. And um, actually, we have been hiring new reporters here in the studio. And one of them is Melissa Melton. And she actually got started and kind of discovered, if you will, through this infographic group. So we pay attention to a lot of really cool stuff on Planet Infowars. Um, and uh, if you missed it, I'm wearing the In the Fed t-shirt, which when you see this message, the uh, sale on it, it's $11.95 on sale in the InfoWarsShop.com just for the end of the day till midnight. Now you can buy at regular price, but um, August 30th, by the end of the day, uh, midnight, it's going to be 
it'll go back to the regular price. So get that uh, while you can and uh, be as cool as me. No, I'm, just kidding. I'm teasing. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Um, patriots out there, y'all are talking and we're listening. So till next time. Alex Jones here with a message that could revolutionize health in this country. Going back about a year and a half ago, I began to learn about the incredible health effects of Longevity products. Aaron Dykes lost 92 pounds. We're going to show you some before and afters. Aaron, break down what happened, your story. I've worked really hard with diet and exercise to try to lose weight, but I just didn't get the results. It just didn't happen. Then I saw what you were doing with InfoWarsTeam.com. I wasn't even trying to lose weight, but I got it because I wanted to feel better energy. I wanted that nutrition. Didn't even understand how that could kickstart my own weight loss goals. But the products did that for me. I found myself suddenly losing weight, more energetic, wanting to exercise, wanting to eat the right foods. And they don't even advertise it as weight loss. I want to challenge our radio listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com. Sign up as a distributor and get wholesale pricing discounts at InfoWarsTeam.com. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dykes, and in just a moment, we're going to have a very interesting interview segment. But first, I want to thank Paul Joseph Watson for doing the News Blitz. And I also want to introduce Dan Badandi, one of our new reporters fielded from the reporter contest, also an activist I've been following for years. He has a wealth of information. It's so interesting talking to him just behind the scenes here in the studio. And he's put together one of his first in-depth reports. It's going to be a two-part report on the government's admitted experimentation and testing on our own soldiers, hundreds of thousands of them, not to mention the other vulnerable and exploited groups they've also done tests on. Uh, so with no further ado, I give you Dan Badandi. This is Dan Badandi reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News. You were always told that the American dream was owning your own home, driving a nice car, having a big family. But in addition, paying your dues to society by joining the armed forces, as seen by many as the right thing to do. But what if I was to tell you that in some cases, joining the military isn't exactly about defending our country, but about being a human test guinea pig for military classified medical experiments, which includes force medicated by drugs, inoculations, inhalation of poisonous gases, and even torture by electrical shocks. Now let's take a good look at this article from CNN. CNN reports vets feel abandoned after secret drug experiments. The moment 18-year-old Private Tim Josephs arrived at Edgewood Arsenal in 1968, he knew there was something different about the place. It just didn't look like a military base, more like a hospital, recalls Joseph, a Pittsburgh native. He quotes, it was like a plum assignment. The idea they would be testing new army field jackets, clothing, weapons, and things of that nature, but no mention of drugs or chemicals. But when he went to fill out the paperwork the morning after his arrival, the base personnel were wearing white lab coats, and Joseph said that he had second thoughts. An officer took him aside and told him, if you don't do it, you're going to jail. And then from 1955 to 1975, military researchers at Edgewood were using not only animals, but human subjects to test witches' brews of drugs and chemicals, they range from potentially lethal nerve gases like VX and sarin to incapacitating agents like BZ. And the military also tested tear gas, tranquilizers, narcotics, hallucinogens like LSD. In this first report, it's a U.S. Army Chemical Research and Development Laboratory's technical report. And as we scroll through the document, you can see the chemicals that they use in reactions of BZ. And in this next document, it's called The Effects of Drugs on Human Operant Performance. And as we scroll through this document and the highlights, you could clearly see that the United States Army used humans for test subjects. In this public record, titled Exclusive CIA Experiments on U.S. Soldiers Linked to Torture Program, 
a number of new articles have been published recently that have highlighted evidence of illegal human experimentation on U.S.-held terrorism prisoners undergoing torture. Then the article goes on to state that this report looks at those recent charges and reveals that experiments by a CIA researcher on human subjects undergoing SEER training went unreported in the legal memos of the Bush administration drafted to approve their torture program. It will also connect major military and intelligence figures to the CIA experiments and tie some of them to major science and experimental directorates at the CIA and Special Operations Command. And this article exposes the sinister plot called Project Shipboard Hazard and Defense, known as SHAD, was a program started back in the early 1960s to learn the vulnerabilities of U.S. warships during chemical and biological warfare attacks. Under Project SHAD were 113 different operations or tests. U.S. Naval crews and Marine personnel were spraying various biological chemical germ warfare agents and simulants. Some ships and even marine personnel were sprayed from overflying aircraft, while other tests on ships were being sprayed by aircraft carriers. While some high-ranking personnel may have had knowledge of what was happening, most of the ship's crews did not. Project Shad was controlled by the U.S. Army Desert Test Center, later known as the Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah. And for over 35 years, the Department of Defense said there was no Project Shad. This report and these military classified documents you have just seen are nothing but the tip of the iceberg. And keep in mind, folks, that most military are completely unaware that they are being tested on by their own government. In part two of this special report, we're going to look at government admission of using troops as guinea pigs and its links to suicides. And this is Dan Bedani reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News. Thanks, Dan, for that report. Very interesting indeed. Now, before we turn to our primary interview subject, Michael J. Murphy, I want to give you a preview of his latest film, Why in the World Are They Spraying? And it's fascinating, the agenda he's put together through his thorough research. Take a look. My name is Scott Stevens. I uh, was a television weatherman for 20 years. These chemtrails are absolutely required to impact whatever weather event they were designing. And the trails were an absolute necessary ingredient for them to achieve their weather modification goals. Chemtrails are a key element in the whole thing because they're obviously a way of uh, putting a highly reflective material into the atmosphere. With cloud seeding, the cooling will be achieved by making clouds reflect a bit more sunlight back to space than they would otherwise, and less sunlight reaching the surface would tend to cool the planet. So let's say we were doing geoengineering because we wanted to make uh, the weather a little bit better. The more we see these trails in the sky, the less rain we get. Virtually all scientific data, even from the proponents of geoengineering, state clearly saturating the atmosphere with particulates will create drought. Much has been made of this issue of damage from precipitation. If the issue is understanding the climatic response, which was I think most of where this was going, and it's exactly where the precipitation gets higher and lower, there will be monsoon failures during that period, there will be huge hurricanes. It's likely to cause some damage in some places. The global studies indicate there will be some impact on precipitation patterns, and obviously there's a lot more opportunity for work in that area. Just seeding can be pretty effective for the clouds we explored, but the interactions between seeding and precipitation in the form of drizzle are really complex. So we're finding the aerosols, the metal particulates, the weather engineering, whether it's scalar, ionic, or organ, or the chi of the atmosphere, all of those can be used and, and leveraged to create weather events that are several standard deviations or outside what would be typically normal. Pretty brush forms known, the manzanita, and it, it looks like it's been hit with insecticide, and we're seeing this throughout the ecosystem, and there's virtually no growth, and we see whole plants, whole mature plants, 50, 60, 70 year old, almost trees die out for no reason whatsoever that, that we can find other than the contaminated soils. So if it's in the rain, it's in the soil. And now we see incredibly hardy organisms dying uh, for no other cause that we can find other than the contamination in our rain from these aerosol operations. And so you get ecosystem collapses. And if you control the weather, 
you're going to control the planet. It's that simple. The work we're doing will provide cover for others to come out. And I'm most interested in whistleblowers. So that is the trailer for Why in the World Are They Spraying? The follow-up to the hugely provocative film, What in the World Are They Spraying? We have both at Infowars.com. You can get just the new film, or you can get them both in the Chemtrails special package, discounted at $34.95. Why in the World Are They Spraying? is $19.95. We are joined now by the main producer, one of the co-producers of both films, Michael J. Murphy. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Hey, thanks for having us on, Aaron, and uh, thanks for covering this most dire issue. Those of us who have been researching this uh, believe that there has been no greater threat to our planet uh, than the ongoing chemtrail geoengineering programs that we're now experiencing around the world. So thank you. So a lot of people saw the first film, What in the World Are They Spraying? And it was the right time for that film because it's something people have been talking about for decades. It had been admitted in different lingo in the academic circles. But by this point, it's become an unavoidable issue that no one in the media is talking about. There's no one giving answers on the issue other than a bunch of climate scientists saying it could be one way to solve what they say is the global warming problem. What have you really found? What kind of questions have come out since the first film? And what's been the overall public reaction that led you to make this follow-up film? Well, the, the reaction was great. Uh, we went to a geoengineering conference and actually filmed geoengineers talking about their plans and proposals uh, for spraying 10 to 20 million tons of toxic aluminum oxide and other particles into our sky. Uh, they state that these programs are for the mitigation of global warming. Uh, aluminum oxide is very reflective, uh, and that's the theory that putting these aerosols into the sky will reflect the sun. Since we released uh, what in the world are they spraying? People from around the world have been uh, testing rain. Rain uh, is a very good indicator of atmospheric contamination and what they're finding around the world uh, is what many people are calling the chemtrail geoengineering footprint of aluminum, barium, and strontium. Uh, these metals match a number of geoengineering patents that were uh, devices to de actually designed to spray these metals out of airplanes. Uh, they match what geoengineers deny they're spraying, but state they urgently want to spray. Uh, geoengineers now are calling for emergency geoengineering to start as early as 2013. Uh, that's in less than one year. And uh, what we see in the sky uh, on a regular basis, these long lingering trails that do not dissipate, they spread out and they block their sun, uh, is an express goal of geoengineering programs. We now have an issue called uh, global dimming. The Earth is receiving 20% uh, less sun than it did just a couple decades ago, and that is also a stated goal of geoengineering. So what we found uh, after we produced the f uh, film, we found a number of studies that indicate uh, actually putting aerosols into our sky. These are NASA studies and university studies. And Aaron, I, I don't necessarily trust NASA, but uh, uh, it indicates that putting aerosols into our sky will temporarily regionally cool the planet and you'll notice on warm days when they begin to spray uh, the temperature below those aerosols drops about five to seven degrees however at night the aerosols act as a blanket they trap heat and that's exactly what these studies indicate so the question really that we've been asked is why is this happening so we began to look into many of the agendas and there are many agendas associated with these programs but it looks like and it appears based on our studies that weather control uh, is one of the main uh, agendas now you say weather control, obviously a lot of our audience is well aware of this issue, has done their own research, seen Alex and others talking about it for years, but a lot of other new listeners, people out there may not realize what a mainstream idea weather control is. Can you just explain briefly the history and how prevalent weather control admittedly is at this point in time? Well, absolutely, and weather control has been going on for over 100 years. Uh, they, they learn, the, the people interested in these types of technologies, learn that putting particulates into our sky could affect where rain falls or where it doesn't fall. Uh, it's been used by the military for a number of years, which we'll get into uh, in, in the interview. But there is uh, our companies now that focus on weather control. Uh, and typically, historically, they have used silver iodide. So it's been very regional. Uh, and ski uh, resorts have used it to get snow uh, when, when those clouds uh, have been seeded. 
What we're seeing now, though, is much different because the, the weather modification, again, was very small programs. Uh, they affected uh, just a small region. We now have an agenda to completely corporatize our weather. And what we began to notice uh, in the investigation about 500 to 700 miles ahead of storms, we, that, those are the days where you saw the intense trailing back and forth, back and forth, uh, when, when the sky turned into this milky white. And then within 24 to 72 hours, you see these intense storms coming in. So we met with uh, former 20-year weatherman, uh, Scott Stevens, and Nick Begich, who is a harp expert, and he explained to us some of the science, which is very basic behind these programs. And if you look back to what we're finding in rain tests, again, in very, very major quantities, uh, and the geoengineering's main uh, ingredient is aluminum oxide. And uh, while aluminum oxide is very reflective, we also found that it was a very effective conductor in our sky. So by putting a blanket of aluminum uh, in our sky, and by the way, that's why we're seeing an increase in lightning around the world, because uh, aluminum's, uh, again, it is a very effective conductor. But by putting uh, a canopy into our sky, they literally, through the use of HARP and other technologies, have the ability to heat up that canopy. And what does a heated atmosphere do? It raises. And in that raising, it literally creates a low pressure vacuum and enables these corporations to literally steer storms into certain regions or, uh, the case of this summer, out of certain regions. Uh, we went back and we also looked at, uh, at a number of the, the geoengineers talking about their conference. I went through about 12 hours of footage and found out uh, that one of the consequences of geoengineering programs is disrupted weather patterns. It's ozone depletion. We now have a huge ozone hole uh, above, our, uh, above the no northern hemisphere. Uh, and they state that these programs could disrupt the food supply of over 2 billion people, but I'll get into that in a second. But the, the science behind this, uh, these particulates are nanoparticles, and they act as what's called cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, and again, geoengineers are very open. They state if we start these programs, uh, we will have drought. And the reason is this. Um, uh, the cloud condensation nuclei, when normal water evaporates from the, the ocean, it uh, evaporates and combines with other water molecules. And when it condenses, it, it forms a cloud and eventually rains. But when these particulates are introduced into the atmosphere, instead of the water condensing, it actually condenses on these metal particulates and it drifts. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing drought conditions in California, uh, because the rain that we should be getting drifts over the continental divide but eventually it has to fall and that's why we're seeing the intense flooding in the midwest and then in uh in on the east coast because again it does have to fall remarkable thing that we've seen this summer without question is an engineered drought a lot of people have been contacting me stating mike you know they're, they're not spraying uh, over california i think they've stopped the program so we started looking at satellite and what we noticed the entire Pacific all summer long from the equator all the way up to Alaska is completely covered by aerosols. And what this does, a couple of things, again, going back to uh, the basic science, it prevents uh, the sunlight from hitting the ocean. Uh, so we're not getting as much evaporation, which forms our clouds. And then the evaporation that does occur, again, instead of falling as rain, it, uh, it actually uh, hooks on to this metal particulate and it drifts. Interesting, Aaron, I was in the Midwest. Uh, they're having an intense drought there. And when uh, storms and when rain was in the forecast, I would go outside and I would watch the storms and we'd see the storms starting to build and these big cumulus thunderheads would start developing and then the planes would come, boom, back and forth, back and forth, putting, literally seeding these clouds. And within about 45 minutes, we would see the clouds collapse and the moisture would drift and it wouldn't rain. So again, uh, definitely an agenda to create droughts. What we found, and hopefully we'll get into in the interview, is there are many agendas, many uh, corporations, many individuals that benefit both financially, and there are a lot of political agendas that can be used by weather control, weather modification. Well, we definitely want to go there, but I just want to point out, you're already saying this isn't just well-meaning scientists who think they're going to fix the earth and haven't considered all the risks that are there. These are people who know the risks and are willing to implement it on purpose, knowing this is going to happen. I mean, that is total bombshell, and no one's stopping them. There's no informed consent. There's no public dialogue other than this flimsy pretext that it has to do with the global warming issue. Well, I, and I think that's an important point that, that you stated. Again, geoengineers 
state, you know, our programs are very damaging. Uh, they will deplete our ozone. That is our protective layer. Again, we has, have a huge hole over the northern hemisphere. Most people now are beginning to notice that they burn very quickly in the sun. I used to be able to sit out in the sun for four or five hours. Now, within about half an hour, I start to burn. That is because our protective layer is literally being shredded every time they put more aerosols into our sky. Um, uh, some of the other consequences, they state that if they start these programs, and of course they have, potentially two billion people could have their food disrupted. Guess what? People are having their food disrupted. Uh, they talk about pH changes of the soil. In the first film, we covered that. Uh, up in Northern California, where they typically have an acidic soil, we're seeing 10 to 12 times the normal alkalinity of the soil. Of course, this is collapsing not only natural food supplies, but forests around the world. Uh, and why in the world are they spraying? We interviewed several farmers across the globe. They are seeing collapses due to many different stresses. Um, uh, which we'll get to hopefully in a minute, but these programs are literally devastating. This is complete corporatization of our weather and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the human health implications are unquantifiable. Uh, we're not only find, finding aluminum in the rain, but people now have began taking blood tests. And again, they're finding this chemtrail geoengineering footprint of aluminum, barium, and strontium. We have seen aluminum-related illnesses go through the roof in Riverside County alone. We've seen uh, Alzheimer's uh, go up over 260%. Uh, we see ADD. Uh, uh, asthma going through the roof, respiratory mortality went from number three, uh, eight down to number three in just a six year period, and uh, barium lowers our immune system. So we're constantly inhaling this, and it's uh, depleting our, uh, our immune systems as well. So it's deeply concerning to us just from the human health and ecological standpoint, but it goes much deeper than that, and that's what we investigated uh, really was the financial uh, components of this and then the genetically modified seed component, there are definitely corporations that are literally making billions of dollars this summer alone. Right. Well, let's get right into that. Of course, Bill Gates is a known big player on this front. He has major stock in Monsanto. They've been pushing things like drought resistant crops as a solution for Africa. They've been pushing aluminum resistant crops, which may have a direct relation with this geoengineering issue. And there's so much more involved. Let's start to get into that. I don't know if you want to talk about Bill Gates specifically or the bigger picture, but there are major financial incentives here and major rigging of the games. They're controlling the inputs uh, to determine who's going to make money on these markets. And it impacts everything, including especially our food supply. And you've already got one to two billion people at or close to the edge of starvation. This is going to have very costly effects if this is not stopped. It, it absolutely is. And, and from the financial standpoint alone, in investigating this, we learned that weather is being traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And I'm going to say that again because my mouth dropped when I learned this. Weather is being traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Weather is being traded, yeah. Yeah, it had to be said three times because I couldn't believe it myself. So uh, we, uh, we contacted a trader and went out to Chicago and we found out about weather derivatives. And certain corporations uh, are interested in these. We met with trader Mike Agney who explained that derivatives are a way for corporations or individuals to offset the risk due to adverse weather conditions. So uh, certain heating companies would be interested in it, uh, insurance companies, or even companies that have crops. And the example that he used uh, was this. Let's say if you have $5 million worth of a crop, uh, but you insure it through the use of these derivatives for $10 million, you have a financial incentive for that crop to fail. Uh, and what he further went on to say is, Every commodity is driven by the ability to predict weather. So those who knew about this drought, I'm not saying everybody involved with these weather derivatives is uh, involved in insider trading. And most people think that our weather is 100% natural. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. We proved that. And why in the world are they spraying? So those, again, who had the playbook are literally making billions of dollars this summer just on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. But 
playing with derivatives. But I want to stop you and add to that. They're, okay, so they're trading weather, trading derivatives on the future of weather, but it's also become a big scandal that they're betting on the future of food commodities. It's become such a scandal in Europe that certain banks are backing off of it, mainly for public relations reasons. But you've got people betting on the future of weather, the future of crops, and all this is going on as they produce crops for ethanol instead of for food and... and well, let's get back into it. Well, Aaron, there's no question about it. We have seen considerable uh, increases in both our gasoline and our food prices. This is nothing. Because of this year's drought, which, again, we illustrated it without question, is an engineered drought. There are people, again, making billions of dollars uh, just from the food market. So corn, which is a, a major, the Midwest is one of the, uh, the largest suppliers or the largest supplier in the world. Most food products contain corn. We're going to see over over, I believe, a 30% increase in food prices. This is going to impact everybody in, in certain capacities. So not only do we have the human health implications, the ecological implications, but the financial implications. And in many uh, cities now in lower income communities, we're going to see a great increase in crime because a lot of people who I've been speaking to, I hit the streets on a daily basis. I hand out free DVDs and I've been talking to people out in uh, South Central Los Angeles in the Inglewood communities asking, what would you do if, if your food prices go up 30 percent? And the, the, the answer was, you know, we will just be devastated. We do not know. So we're going to end up seeing a lot of homelessness, uh, a lot of people being affected in major ways just in these capacities. But the big concern uh, of ours was what I think the bigger picture, and this goes, uh, it goes uh, into an agenda that's much, much greater than simply financial. <clears throat> well, please go into it right now. <laughs> I was going to give you a toss, Aaron. Well, what, what we found out, we interviewed uh, Barb Peterson of Farm Wars, and, and uh, in the first film we covered an aluminum-resistant seed, and of course aluminum uh, is falling into our soils, contaminating our soils, but Barb called me up and she said, you know what, I think I found something that's more compelling that's completely related to geoengineering. So we talked to her and we found uh, about some studies. EPA is stating that... Uh, we, by 2030, we will see a 50% increase in crop loss due to abiotic stress. And this is very significant. What is abiotic stress? Abiotic stress is everything that the chemtrail geoengineering programs create. It's the drought. It's the heavy metal contamination. Uh, it's too much moisture and it's fungal uh, overgrowth. Uh, geoengineering programs, chemtrails, actually block our sun. Because of that, they proliferate uh, fungal growth, which again leads to this abiotic stress. Well, guess what, Aaron? There is a solution to abiotic stress. Aren't you excited? <laughs> Perhaps it has to do with stopping the geoengineering? Oh, God, we wish it wouldn't. I guess that's where, where it falls into our hands. Uh, let me rephrase that. There is a corporate solution. Monsanto. Oh, you mean the Hegelian dialectic solution? Yeah, okay. Right, right. Not the good solution that we're working towards uh, getting these programs stopped, but they have a corporate, in it, which is a political and monetary solution. It's this uh, genetically modified seed that addresses abiotic stress. It addresses the drought that we're seeing. It addresses too much moisture. It addresses the heavy metal contamination. And they have seeds now uh, everywhere uh, from apples to zucchini, which addresses this. So not only uh, is this, uh, are certain individuals stripping the public of their fine finances and resources. This is literally about destroying natural systems and again through the Hegelian dialectic corporatizing our complete natural food supply. What we found, we, uh, we interviewed uh, biologist Francis Mangles who has been doing soil tests, doing rain tests. Forests around the world are collapsing. This thing goes deeper than I thought. It, it, it just blows my mind. Uh, there is a company, it's a spinoff of Monsanto, it's called Arbigen, and they are genetically modifying forests. So again, through the destruction of our soils, we have ecosystems collapsing. These corporations come in with their solution. Uh, Aaron, this is prophesied in every major religion, so we have this big uh, corporate governmental conglomerate, which I call the beast, 
that wants to desperately control everything. So through death and destruction, they are literally destroying our ability to live independent and live off of nature. Uh, I uh, spend a lot of my time on an organic farm in Maui when I'm not here working with Barry Kolsky, uh, who is my co-producer uh, with films. And we live independent from the corporate system. Primarily, we grow our own food. We're dependent on rain, uh, sunshine, and natural seeds. Well, the concern that we have, uh, the farmers that we've interviewed, uh, have seen between a 60 and 70 percent decline in their ability to grow natural organic foods. So we're seeing family farms or seeing smaller farmers uh, a either go out of business, and the ones that go out of business are forced to sell their farmlands. So this is directly related as well to Agenda 21. There's been a company owned by George Soros who is now coming in. They're buying that farmland at pennies on the dollar. Uh, but the ones that want to stay alive end up going to these genetically modified seeds. So again, through the death and destruction of our natural systems, these corpor corporations are literally usurping the authority of nature or the authority of God, and they're bringing it under corporate authority so that these natural systems can be controlled by corporations and the entities who control these corporations. Well, Again, yeah, they're trying to eradicate the natural order of things, literally turning on, on its head from, you know, the basic gardening idea of plucking out the weeds and keeping the things you want to grow. They want to destroy everything natural, so you have to grow their intellectual patent product. And so it's this horrible mixture of mad scientists meets monopoly men meets uh, intellectual property, you know, Monsatanist, I guess. Monsatan. And Aaron, this comes down to, to the real basic premise. premise. This conglomerate, the people behind this, they want to be life. They want to be the source of life. And through genetic modification, they are. Now, if we allow them to continue this, and if we allow them to continue to corporatize every natural system, they will have complete control over our food supply. That gives them complete control over po the uh, population. It gives them complete control over the world. And geoengineer David Keith made a statement about two years ago. He stated, geoengineering gives man godlike power. These people are literally playing God. And again, they're selling this to the public is, you know, some of you are going to be uh, really affected in a negative way. Uh, geoengineers state that uh, if they implement these programs, there will be droughts in Africa and Asia. And geoengineers are having this dialogue. They're stating, how do we deal with this issue of equity uh, in, in terms of uh, the people who are losers? How do we deal with that? How do we compensate the countries that, that are going through the drought from these programs? I mean, it's, it's literally insidious, it's disgusting, uh, and it's something that definitely needs to be addressed because we're at a very, very crucial time. Uh, they. According to uh, former 20-year weatherman Scott Stevens, who's in the film, he believes that all of our weather currently is corporatized. If we look down at Isaac, Hurricane Isaac, you can see aerosols all around that hurricane, and it was making uh, funny turns. I, I think I saw that you covered it uh, last night in some of the directional changes. Without question, that has been manipulated. Um, but with that being said, again, this is giving up all of our resources and all of our power to these corporations unless we, A, get educated and then reach out to communities. But Aaron, we're seeing communities rise up. Uh, after I uh, produced the first film, of course, we're encouraging people who purchased the film to make copies and hand out for free. We focused on a couple of areas. Uh, Maui, Hawaii was one of them. Uh, I'm an activist at heart. We handed out literally thousands of free DVDs uh, and met with the mayor's office and had a lot of screenings. As a result, we have the Maui Clean Sky ordinance uh, and that was an ordinance that was established right now it's in the council it's going to go to vote pretty soon uh, that will effectively ban chemtrail geoengineering programs without two things an environmental impact statement which they will never get and informed consent because the people are informed on Maui they will never get that so my hope is uh, is uh, making this film which is it's again the, the response from why in the world are they spraying has been much better than the first film and the first film was very effective at waking millions of people up uh, our greatest hope is that people will bring this uh, in into the public waking people up and really we we have uh, such a great opportunity and a great chance at getting these programs stopped uh, once we have critical mass and we're very close to getting critical mass once we have it no more ge geoengineering and we're going to have to do that. I want to talk about some of the military applications uh, because there's a lot going on there as well. I mean, first of all, in all the public documents related to geoengineering or suspected related programs prior to that, we see things like the Air Force saying we're going to, quote, 
own the weather by 2025. They talk about owning the weather, and here we are seeing an agenda for controlling the weather. Then we look more closely at Monsanto. They were very much involved in military applications during Vietnam with Agent Orange and so forth. And then we see so many former secretaries of defense, major people from the Pentagon serving as CEOs or top advisors at Monsanto and related companies. How much does this have to do with direct military intervention? Is this a uh, war by other means? Oh, it definitely is. And uh, interviewing Dr. Nick Baggage, of course, his brother is a senator in Alaska. You know, he, he explained to us what many of us are, are aware of here, here on uh, InfoWars. The military is controlled by corporations. Our government has been hijacked. So, uh, but initially, I think weather control had, had good motives, you know, back 100 years ago, and it was to help people who, who were having droughts. But now we have it in uh, this technology that has been put into the hands of militaries. Uh, and militaries were interested at first, I think, to protect their countries. Uh, owning the weather by 2025 is a stated goal of our military. And in the paper, it talks about the weather uh, acting as a force multiplier. So uh, the ability to control weather, you can literally cripple uh, an enemy's uh, supply lines like they did in Project Popeye in the Vietnam War, uh, where through the use of this technology, they actually flooded out the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, mm -hmm. with a very high amount of rain. Uh, you can, if you can cripple the enemy uh, is, uh, by, by creating weather events so they can't get their airplanes off of the ground, it's a very effective weapon. Or uh, in the case of what looks like Iran, they're literally, uh, Ahmadinejad came out, he said Western countries were using weather control to create droughts in our country. If you create droughts in countries, this technology could be used literally to create instability in certain countries. So again, militaries have been, uh, have been interested in this. There was a treaty called the Enmod Treaty. It was made, uh, it was put in place back in 1972 or 73, and it, uh, it uh, prohibited the use of uh, this technology using the weather uh, in warfare applications. Dr. Nick Baggage explained to us an exemption with this treaty, and the exemption is this. Countries can use this technology over their own soil. So Scott Stevens, former weatherman, explained to us, you can literally manipulate weather or manipulate a jet stream and have effects to the weather several thousand miles away, and that's exactly what's going on. And by the um, way, that's why we saw the Council on Foreign Relations when they hosted Ken Caldera and David Keith debating the question, can we ethically or, or in terms of international relations get away with unilateral geoengineering. That, that's right. And they are talking about forming global governance to uh, to monitor these programs. They're stating, you know, once we start, of course, they have started, uh, who gets control of the thermostat? You know, they said you, you could imagine there would be wars. So, of course, we have to consolidate an enormous amount of political power into uh, our hands. Yeah, yeah, our hands. Mm. We, we would be the good stewards of this. The answer is quite simple. Uh, God like power in the hands of these fools. No, no, we're not going to accept it. Um, and what again, Aaron, this is the short of nuclear fallout. We have had no greater threat to the planet. Our soils are devastated. Our protective layer, the ozone layer is being decimated every day. Um, and these uh, these uh, programs actually warm the planet. So it appears that there is some ice that is warming, uh, creating methane release. And if that is true, uh, that uh, I believe is directly due again to the geoengineering because it traps heat in uh, at night. So we're seeing devastations to our planet. Uh, and uh, this is really, if we allow these programs to continue, this is the end of natural life here on this planet as we know it. I just want to point out to people who are new to this issue, I've investigated it, you've investigated it, there are mountains of documentation. When you talk about stuff like the military using weather in Vietnam or in other areas where they want to disrupt the enemy, that is not speculation, it's documented. If you think they're going to introduce uh, weather control so that it doesn't rain during Olympic ceremonies, you'd better believe they're gonna use it in a war context. If they're gonna do that, they're gonna use it against the general population as well. It's been done throughout history. Dictators always control the food supply and then use it as justification to weaken or directly attack or kill people. And, and we are the enemies in this case, the people that live off of nature, the way that we live uh, in Hawaii. We do not support the corporations. Of course, they want all the power, so they're destroying our natural way uh, to live. An interesting thing, Aaron, uh, what we uncovered in the film, 
uh, many people have began noticing and started calling us stating, why is it snowing in the 40s? Why is it snowing in the lower 50s? And I called Scott up and he said, you know what? When it was snowing, you know, when I was a weatherman, we'd see it starting to snow in the upper 30s. And he said, we were very shocked by it. But he said, now that's being pushed up towards the 50s. What we came and, and came, came upon was a patent owned by NASA. And it was uh, ice nucleation for weather modification. Again, this is a patent owned by NASA to create artificial snowstorms up to close to 50 degrees. It's very similar to technology as an, an ice pack that you might have in your first aid kit where uh, the, the, the contents uh, stay at room temperature until you break that content, mixing the chemicals together, and then it turns into ice. So the Chinese uh, have bragged about using this technology. They've, they've uh, actually st uh, uh, been public about it uh, until they did over a billion dollars worth of damage in Beijing, and then they stopped talking about it. So the technology is there. We're seeing it come into fruition. And, and you know, Aaron, the film is coming out at the perfect time because we started this a little less than a year ago and uh, had no idea that the drought would be occurring. We had no idea, but everything that we covered in, in the film is now coming to fruition. So it was at the perfect time. People are ready for this message. They're wondering what is up with the weather. We have that answer. And again, it comes down to two things, uh, consolidation of an enormous amount of both monetary and political power into the hands of a few at the expense of literally every living thing on the planet. This is the end game for the new world mm. order. Again, it gives them godlike power. It gives them control over every natural system. So there are many important issues out there. We don't content test that. Uh, if we don't address this issue, we will not have a planet left, and that's how serious it is. But again, I like to encourage people not to, to address this in fear or anger, but address this in faith, realizing that, A, if we become educated about this and then reach out to our communities, um, people are ready for this message. We have and will get these programs stopped. It's amazing and very timely. You know, other questions, though, you've asked what, you've asked why. Uh, probably the next major question on that list is who? And so we have a lot of major clues about who the big corporate players are, the people who've been promoting geoengineering, uh, people like White House science czar John P. Holdren. Uh, but what about the pilots themselves? Which planes, do we know anything more after years of investigating this about what types of planes are actually doing the spraying? Do the pilots on these planes know what they're involved in? Uh, things like this, Michael Murphy. It's, yeah, that's, that's a good question. It's one that gets asked in just about every interview. Um, there are many questions that still need to be answered, but we do know sh for sure everything that's showing up uh, matches what geoengineering plans, geoengineering patents uh, state that they want to do. Uh, there are a number of corporations and thus a number of different airplanes and a number of different corporations involved in these programs and, and a number of corporations that, uh, that benefit from this. The next film will be who in the hell is spraying, but we have seen uh, a number of military aircraft, KC-135s. There have been people People who have contacted us stating, uh, you know, there are some commercial aircraft, although I think the pilots, if there are commercial aircraft involved, I don't think the pilots have any knowledge of this. I would be very shocked to find out if any of, they, of them did. But I believe the military pilots are well aware uh, of these programs. And one thing that Scott Stevens, former 20-year weatherman, pointed out, he had noticed in the long trails that do not uh, break. We have sometimes when they spray, there are very short spray patterns. So uh, we see short segments of a trail in the air, several of them. And then there are these very long trails uh, that go on for hundreds of miles. And he noticed during the, the points where these areas might have uh, some discontinuity in it, he noticed that another airplane would come directly at the point of that discontinuity in market. So some of these the spraying uh, of these particulates is to literally measure certain parts of the sky and then they, they, uh, they know uh, when and where to pulse some of their technology, whether it's through the HARP system or SCALAR technology. But again, a uh, number of military uh, aircraft involved and I believe the pilots are probably told that they're doing something, you know, that's very good and it's top secret and the public would maybe freak out if they were told what was going on. And that was another reason for making the film, you know, it was really to reach out to to our brothers and sisters in the military and we believe that the quickest way to bring this program down is through the hearts of the people that are involved uh, and, and think that they're doing something good when they find out that 
you know, maybe the reason their child has asthma, maybe the reason that their parents have Alzheimer's, because we've seen these rates go through the roof, and really the future implications, and when they find out this is not about protecting the planet, it's about bringing more power into the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, uh, other globalists, you know, who are at the head of this, this sphere into their hands. But we believe that these programs will dissolve. So again, that's one of the reasons for the film. We encourage people, again, to purchase, order a film at the InfoWars shop, uh, duplicate the DVDs, and bring these to military bases. Hand them out. Uh, bring them into public forums. Because again, once people find out about this, we'll begin to see change. And these questions are so interesting, particularly even people who are informed on it. Once you begin to find out what's going on here, you only have more questions because it's such a compelling issue. It's not something to sweep under the rug. We've got to get to the heart of this matter. So obviously, the biggest thing is turning the tide of public awareness, letting people know that what seems unbelievable, manipulating the weather, is very real, very much going on. Uh, but a, a related question, what do you see for people like Bill Gates, I use him as an example because I know the most about his specific ties. He owns stock in companies that do hurricane and weather control. He owns stock in the geoengineering and is giving grants for the research. At the same time, he owns shares of Monsanto, the very seeds that stand to gain from this. Uh, he's an example of someone along with the Rockefellers, along with Monsanto, who own shares and have interest in the Arctic seed vaults, where they're preserving the original heirloom seeds and everything. Can we begin to address some of these people on conflicts of interest? Can we hold them to account criminally or at least get some kind of official inquiry on why they have these obvious conflicting agendas and the harm that they obviously pose? I think that's one of the uh, many important steps that we need to take. And, and again, Bill Gates, we included him, uh, his story in Why in the World Are They Spraying? Again, uh, now it's public knowledge. We were unable to, uh, to add that, include that in the first film, What in the World Are They Spraying? But now that it's public knowledge, yes, uh, Bill Gates is, is uh, funding uh, David Keith, Ken Caldera, these other nas internationally recognized geoengineers. So through these programs that literally are sterilizing and destroying our soil, he is making money on the back end uh, through his investment in Monsanto and uh, the giant seed vault. Uh, I was just reading again about that this morning. The the uh, the uh, the seed vault that these criminals have. Did I say criminals? Yeah, I did say criminals. Okay, <laughs> might have been a Freudian slip, but they are criminals. Uh, that they have um, that should tell us something of. Uh, what their plans are. Monsanto has an agenda. They're very open about it. They want to own everything that grows. Uh, these programs will enable them to bring that into fruition. So through the death and destruction of natural systems, of our forests, of our crops, uh, they have the ability to thrive, and it's only through death. So you look at like, you know, you look at a country like Africa. Uh, 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 President Obama just opened up the door for Monsanto to go into Africa. If Africa has, has bumper crops, if, if they're growing with nature and growing and independent from their own food supply, why would they give up their natural seeds to Monsanto? Um, so, so what they're doing, and again, geoengineers are selling these programs to the American public, saying, oh, it's not going to create droughts here in America. No, it's not going to affect you, but it might affect those people over in Africa. There's nothing special about the region here in America that's anything different than Africa and Asia. Geoengineering programs, because these particulates act as cloud condensation nuclei, they hold on to that moisture and that moisture drifts instead of falling like rain. Again, geoengineers are very open about this. And if you look on the global drought monitor, you will see that much of the world, the majority of the world, is in severe drought. So again, uh, a country that would have no reason to go to these genetically modified seeds unless things are dying, things are dying. Uh, another point that I wanted to make uh, about this, and I, I call it aluminum uh, uh, brain because sometimes I forget, uh, there are documented cases now of people that have dementia in their 40s and even Alzheimer's uh, in their 40s, again, aluminum, shame, which we're shame. inhaling on a daily basis. And these particulates are nanoparticulates. We typically have a blood brain barrier which will protect us from these types of particles getting to our brain, but they do get to our brain. Um, so anyways, they are uh, going into Africa, and many of these seeds are what's called terminator seeds. So typically a farmer would historically plant a crop. They would get 
uh, their harvest at the end of the year and save seeds so that they could plant for the next planting season. Many of the seeds now that they're planting are, again, what are called terminator seeds. They do not regenerate. So what that does, it makes the farmer dependent year after year after year to Monsanto. And now studies are coming out that indicate uh, that uh, certain animals now, animal studies with GMO foods, are showing that they're, uh, after three generations, there is sterilization. Again, looks like the state wants to be the source of life and a number of other health implications and environmental implications. Michael Murphy, that is a huge bombshell. The, no, the health risks have been known. People like Jeffrey and Smith have analyzed the huge destruction from what is only now on the market, a handful of GMO crops. I mean, just by the way, they have more than 120 genetically modified seeds ready to go for fast track approval. They've got the government bought off and they show no signs of stopping. They are causing sterility, kind of a sleeper infertility that goes down the line. It's passed down. There's organ damage, all kinds of health effects just from the GMO seeds not being looked at, not being dealt with. In fact, research is being stifled, and that's just with a handful of genetically modified crops. They have more than 120 genetically modified crops ready to be brought on the market in the next 10, 15, 20 years. It's going to be fast-tracked approved. They've got all these governments bought out. They've owned the weather. They've tried to own the policies around the world, and they're pushing this on all of us. They're not going to stop. The implications could not be greater. That's why I really appreciate that you've made this film. It's been an activist effort. You've uh, pulled your resources, gotten the experts to help you do the research, get this all on DVD. What in the world were they spraying was such a huge uh, eye-opener for people who didn't even know what this issue was really about. So I'm so glad you've now made why in the world are they spraying to really start to focus on the details of their agenda. Everybody has to watch this. We do have it at the InfoWarsShop.com. Uh, they're bundled in a discount, or you can get them individually. It's at InfoWars.com. But your closing comments, Michael J. Murphy. Well, the, again, the film has been out for less than two weeks. It's had over a quarter million hits uh, on the Internet. It's available for free. But we encourage people who order a DVD and purchase a DVD to uh, make copies and hand out for free. And that's a very effective way uh, to get out into your community. When we initially started the film, never meant it to be the leading film. We always wanted to lead with the first film. The feedback that we're getting now is... This has to be the leading film. We not only cover all the basics that we covered in the first film, uh, we bring it a step further. And it's the next prudent step. There are a number of uh, agendas associated with these programs. But again, based on the research, credible university scientists uh, and professors that we included in the film, uh, aerosols. Uh, are required uh, to be in our sky in order to impact the weather uh, for these corporations to achieve their goal. And it's very quite simple. We end the film with the statement made uh, by former 20-year weatherman Scott Stevens, if you control the weather, you control the planet. It's that simple. So very excited to be working with Barry Kolsky. He was the editor on the first project that really brought in the professional touch. Uh, he has several hours of working on TV and, uh, and uh, per, uh, other things here in Hollywood. So it was really excited to partner with him. And again, uh, the film's been getting rave reviews. But please watch the film. Most importantly, become educated about this and bring this message out into the community. People used to look at people associated with these programs when you talked about it and said you're a kook. Not anymore. That age is over. Uh, the way that this has been outlined, it's been, again, a very effective tool for activism. So thanks again for covering this and partnering with us in getting this message out to the world. Really appreciate everything you're doing over there at InfoWars. And likewise with you, we thank you for joining us. And obviously, public awareness is the key. We've got to get this information out. Uh, if we have to say that three or four times, it, it can't be said enough. So that's it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. But I hope you'll spread this program in general to everyone you know, but specifically this interview on geoengineering. What are these chemtrail phenomenons we've heard so much about? Well, the questions are asked and answered in these two companion films. And you heard him. He's working on other films as well. Again, the first one, more than a year and a half old. What in the world are they spraying? But the new one that you must see, that you must check out. And again, it's online for free. But in high-quality DVD ready to hand out to people at InfoWars.com. Why? Why are they doing it? Why in the world are they spraying? Michael J. Murphy, thank you very much. And we'll be back again tomorrow on the InfoWars Nightly News. Don't forget about PrisonPlanet.tv and PlanetInfoWars.com. Good night.